Hey guys, today we're going to compare analog starters to digital starters. Automotive technology is changing so much that everything is becoming very computer controlled. So the technology we use to remote start and use in remote starters and security systems and interface modules has had to change and evolve along with it. Today I'm going to compare analog starters to digital starters and try to make some clarifications for a lot of people because when people come into our shops, we tell them that they need to use a particular product but they want to use something else because it's cheaper, but it might not be the right application. Let's start with the analog starter. This has been around for quite some time now, and this is what people are used to seeing. Here I have a Viper 4105V, and this is the most common and basic type of analog starter that we ever do. Typically though, on most newer vehicles, you have to add an integration module like this one for my data link, because most newer vehicles, a lot of things are computer controlled and they have factory mobilizers, and this alone, if we just to use this product, it's not enough to start the vehicle. You'll most likely have to add something like this to actually get it to start. Now, back in the early 2000s, this is a big argument we'd have with customers because everyone's like, no, I don't have an immobilizer. It was very new technology and people weren't aware of it. Now, most people understand that they have chip keys, that they understand they have to buy two products. So you see here you have a brain, remotes, thick gauge ignition wiring. This is what's going to use to fire up everything at the key tumbler, essentially. Uh, Here's keyless, and here's some other wires that would be used for light flash and ground and OEM alarm control. Now, I find a lot of people, when they come to the shop, they're like, oh, it's just easy, you just hook it up, or you just throw it in and plug it in. It's like, well, yes and no. I plug in these to here, but I have to build harnessing, and then I have to choose which wire, because this is a universal application. So what, in, what a good install shop does is they prep their harness on the bench and everything, and they tailor this unit to work in that particular vehicle depending on what the vehicle needs to work. So when is the analog starter appropriate for your vehicle? It's when your vehicle is still using ignition wiring that would have 12 volts on and off. Now a lot of newer vehicles like the Toyota we're about to work on is mostly analog at the ignition but it's thin gauge, it's very low draw so we actually have to step this down, this wire is actually too thick. So when it's, when it's a very rudimentary simple type of vehicle where you don't have a lot of computer signals telling everything to turn on, the analog starter is actually going to work a lot better. It's usually a more robust design and designed to work in that style of vehicle and the way everything turns on. This is the unit to go with. Okay, so what's all this hoopla about digital starters? Here I've opened up a directed 4X10 model. Idealink also has their own as well, and both are used depending on the vehicle. So when it comes to Volkswagens and Mopars, for example, I really prefer to use the 4X10. However, though, on Toyotas like the one I was talking about, uh, with the H key, you can actually use this digital starter because it has remotes and everything, because it has the ability to do thicker gauge wire and control an analog aspect as well as the digital. Technically, the 4X10 does as well, but when it comes to the relay pack, I'm not a big fan of it. Here's the relay pack I'm talking about. This allows you to actually use the 4X10 or 5X10 platform. The 5X10 would be the security system and remote starter on an analog-based vehicle. I just don't think it's the right application, so I tend to stay away from it. But the idea link part can actually do both. But, you know, this is where I say right application, right product for the right application. Here's an example. If you're driving in the wintertime, yes, you could, work, you could use a Dodge Viper with summer tires in the snow. Yes, it will technically work. It will work horribly, but it will technically work. And yes, in the summertime, I could take a Ford SVT Raptor with its off-road tires and very, you know, suspension, a suspension setup designed to accommodate bumps on an autocross course. Yes, it will work, but it'll work very poorly. Now let's switch that. Let's use the Viper on an autocross course. I know, okay, Viper, not the best vehicle to use on autocross, but I'm just, go with me on here. I could use the Viper on the autocross course now with its summer tires. It's gonna perform pretty good. Now the Ford Raptor in the snow, Four-wheel drive and off-road tires, all terrains, yes, it's going to perform very well. Same thing with these. These will work amazing. For example, let's use the newer Dodge Rams, or newer Rams, I should say. These will work amazing in them as opposed to an analog starter with, an with just an integration module. Because they're designed to. The way that they talk to the vehicle is designed to work with those vehicles. As opposed to using an analog starter, it's like... Have you guys ever played the telephone game when you were kids in, high, in like elementary school? And have you noticed that when it gets to the very end, the message is completely different? That's kind of like what it's like when you're on a digital vehicle. If you have 
an analog system talking to an integration module that's talking to the car and then talking back, sometimes things can get lost in translation and it's not going to perform as well. So this is why you would use a digital starter in a digital vehicle. What about interface modules? Okay, this is the part that's in between. Now, typically you're going to see most of these go out. Because a lot of these vehicles are analog based, we tend to like using analog starters. So we're going to add an interface module to talk to the vehicle as well. Interface modules are necessary when a vehicle has a factory mobilizer and we need to make the factory mobilizer think the keys in the ignition when it's actually not, so that way the vehicle can remote start. Another term for these things are called bypasses. I really don't like that term because it makes it seem like these things are so linear and it's very misleading because I'm getting a lot of people asking me if I can install this because their key doesn't work anymore and then they think that this will start the car. Okay, I'm gonna clarify something right now. If your car won't start with the key, it's not gonna start with this because this relies on a properly operating vehicle for it to work because what it does is it copies the key essentially and it sends that signal during the remote start sequence only to let the vehicle start during remote start sequence. Now, you don't wanna rely on something like this always on because that's just not safe. Now we have another point of failure. Like let's say you did get this to work and to bypass your factory mobilizer just so your, your vehicle will run, that's not the way to do it. You need to go to the dealership or some sort of specialist to get that factory mobilizer to perform properly and to get your car running safely. That's the only way. Do not use this product for that. This is only for remote starting purposes and also for security and remote starter convenience. Now, a lot of people don't know is sometimes it's better to install a product like this alongside a security system as well, depending on a vehicle. For example, a Mercedes-Benz uh, Sprinter on the older ones, to do keyless on those things, you need like eight relays. It is so labor intensive and there's so much product and there's so much points of failure. What's the point? When you can just use directed D-Ball 2, you would pay for the product and the labor to install that and all your basic labor, but it keeps it relatively basic and this will interface with the CAN bus system, allowing you control, you can see door pins, and you can also control the locks properly. Because on those Mercedes, they have a very complicated locking system, it's only a one button setup. This will reduce the wiring in the vehicle, making it a lot more reliable. So like I said, again, two different brands, they kind of specialize on, they kind of, for the most part, do the same thing as each other as far as car coverage, but some things on a data link unit will work better then on a directed, and this will always change as the firmware changes. So if you were to watch this video way in the future, maybe these guys got really good at a particular brand that these guys were good at. It just depends on what the engineers are doing. So what you would want to do is you want to talk to your install base shop and see what brands they cover and make sure that's going to be the brand that's going to work best with your vehicle. For today's video, we have two perfect examples of newer vehicles that require two styles of remote starts to be installed. Here we have a 2014 Dodge Grand Caravan and a 2014 Toyota Sienna. The end result is both vehicles are going to accomplish the same thing. They're going to remote start, but both customers have very different needs. The Dodge actually has a very big key with decent range on it, and they don't want to add another key fob, so we're going to remote start it off the factory key fob. While the Sienna over here, it doesn't have as good range with the factory key fob, and we would prefer on types of vehicles like this to use the Viper aftermarket key fob because it's going to work a lot better. I'm finishing up the Dodge now, and you can see here all my wiring is actually thin gauge. On a digital vehicle, you don't have to deal with large thick gauge ignition wiring to run the vehicle. But what we're dealing with nowadays is called a uh, controlled area network bus system or a CAN bus is the term that you'll hear a lot of install shops throw around and it's true. So it's technically, it's a different install nowadays. Like I'm not gonna say it's super easy or super hard because what I find is the programming is harder to do on a digital based vehicle. Uh, just because it's still kind of new to the market and it's really the instructions are really bad right now because like there's a guy in Quebec and he's speaking French and then he's trying to write it in English and then I have to read his English instructions and they're okay but I know it's like word for word it's not right and unless you're an installer that does this day in day out to actually have an idea what to look for I would still like if someone looked at the labor involved in this or I should say the difficulty in labor you would think you could do it but I've seen installers get stumped because they're, it's very particular because you can't really test on this style of install. You just, you just hook it up. You follow the instructions and you hook it up and you're basing it on your experience because I can't take a test light and hook it up to a CAN bus system because one, you're probably going to wreck something or it's just not going to work. 
the other thing is too is vehicle disassembly is still the main thing that's hard to do in this job. Uh, to give you guys an example of if you're careless about disassembling the vehicle, how much it can cost you. I was working on a Dodge Avenger, and those of you who know the Dodge Avenger, you can't access the plug, like you can see it from here, but you actually have to pull the radio out and cut a bunch of plastic out in order to unplug it. So what I was trying to do was like, I was trying to take my pick and try to reach it and like unplug it, push at the clip and then pull it out. And eventually I got it out, but when I was finished the job, the car stopped running because it's called a skim module on these Mopars and it's very flimsy. And as I was using my tool on it, I actually slightly cracked the circuit board without even realizing it. So I actually had to get the car towed. This happens. I got the car towed. It cost our shop 700 bucks to fix from unplugging something. I didn't even start any of the wiring yet. So this is why you want to bring it to a professional shop. And I'm showing you like what the install should look like. It should just be clean, simple. It's going to be very reliable. But, you know, as far as like, can you imagine trying to do this yourself and you unplug something because you're like reefing on a plug because you think that's what you need to do to take it out and all of a sudden your car doesn't start? Not cool. At least if it's at a professional shop, if something bad does happen, which is rare, but it does happen. We're all human. We make mistakes. At least we're going to cover the bill for you. When a remote start is complete, it should look nice and tidy. You're looking at mostly the factory wiring and there is some of my wiring, like the hood pin and everything coming through. But let's see if you guys can see it and detect it. And comment where you think the hood pin wire is coming through. It should be pretty obvious. And then I just have my valet switch over here. I just test the tape it onto an existing harness. I used to drill holes in the panels and put this in, but what would happen is the way, it's hard to put the switch where it's discreet without spending a lot of time. And if I put in like panels like this, people end up kicking it and no one really ever appreciated it either. So I find just taping it nicely onto the harness. One makes it very easy to reverse if you had to but still easy to access. That way if a mechanic ever needs to disable the whole system, flip the switch and then it just goes to sleep. So I'll show you operation of the CEO now. This is Directed Electronics 4X10 Digital Starter System on the factory key fob. You can set your parameters to how long you want the vehicle to run. I usually default to 12 minutes. I don't think excessively eyeing the vehicle is a good idea, but this is enough to get the fluids going, and that way when you get to the vehicle, if you left your defogger on, the ice should be pretty loose enough so it's easy to take off. Again, three times lock, turn off. So you can either turn off manually or you can let it time out. Keep in mind, you can also add on additional remotes if you want extra range or you can add on their smart start to have virtually unlimited range between the vehicle and you and have GPS tracking as well. I have the Toyota all done now. Here's my brain. I don't mind showing this because this isn't the security system. We're just doing a remote starter. I have my ADS AL from my data link, uh, ALCA up here. Uh, I've ran all my wiring as uniform as I could with the factory wiring. So you see all the Tesla stuff, this is all mine. So I had to do a lot of my integration on the body control module over here, or which is also the fuse panel, I believe. I know this is the DCM. And then I uh, clamped the wire over here for all the ignition lines so it's not gonna dangle around and move around when the vehicle's in, um, in motion. And we came up along all the factory harnessing and then we're integrated over here to the ignition wiring. Now on these Toyotas, I actually had to step it down to about 18 gauge wiring off of typically like it's thick it's pretty thick gauge wire over here this is good for most analog systems where it is high draw or high current um, but or high amperage but this one is actually very it's a low current draw but it's all analog signals so to do a better job on this we actually step down the thickness of the wire that way we can actually wrap it around the wire easier and it doesn't get so uh, thick and clumpy up here if you have like all this thick gauge going up here unnecessarily so that's the trick to these Toyotas. When I've completed a whole vehicle, when it comes to a remote starter, I close everything up and I will arm and lock the vehicle to make sure when I remote start it, nothing happens where the vehicle thinks it's being stolen when it's not. This particular vehicle does not have a factory security system, but a lot of them do. And these are things that you have to look out for because we've done installs where things go to sleep and we didn't realize they were asleep. And then when the customer goes to remote start it, the vehicle thinks it's uh, being stolen so the horn starts going off. So here on this Viper remote, we're just going to hit this bottom button with the star in it. Vehicle prime itself, and then it'll start where it's afterwards.
So the vehicle running, we get inside, obviously. And we double check that there's no unnecessary lights during the key takeover. So I turn my ignition on, and when I hit my foot on the brake, it'll turn off the unit. You will hear a click on a lot of these analog starters. So we can see we have our seatbelt light on, door jar light, and emergency brake light, which is all correct. We don't have any check, check engine lights or tire pressure monitor system lights on or anything because we did have to integrate into that system because when we do the key takeover, some systems might not be on and then they might trip a light and then you're driving with that on. If a remote starter is performed properly, you shouldn't have any lights on when you take over with the key. Well guys, hopefully you learned something new about the remote starter and security install world when it comes to product and product selection. So now when you go to an install shop, you can ask them more educated questions where, you know, is my vehicle computer controlled? What's the best product for my vehicle? Because you want to go with an install shop that hopefully carries two brands because that way you have more coverage for your vehicle.